candidates, you have two minutes to deliver your opening remarks. Uh, Laura, you will have the honor and pleasure of going first. Your two minutes start now. First, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters of Kent County for hosting this event, and all of you attending tonight for caring about our schools and doing your best to make an informed decision. Meeting someone for the first time can be an awkward experience, and being here tonight makes me wonder if this is a little what speed dating feels like. But, but of course, I'm not here hoping for the opportunity for a lunch date. I'm hoping to share my heart and my mind with you and to give you an understanding of how my experience as a parent and a professional makes me uniquely qualified to be a valuable school board member. I've been a proud KCPS parent for over 18 years. I am an expert by experience in supporting my own children through their emotional and educational struggles. I've been a single mother for three and a half years now and I'm very grateful for the support that's been available at each of their schools. All parents need support, but I learned firsthand that single parents need more support sometimes, especially when their children are struggling. I have almost 11 years of experience as a special education professional, serving students with developmental disabilities and their families. For the past two and a half years, I've also been a licensed mental health therapist here in Chestertown. The students I serve have many needs, and I have the privilege of working on a diverse and dedicated team that daily goes above and beyond to ensure that our students achieve their greatest potential. John F. Kennedy said that children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. I wholeheartedly agree and hope to serve Kent County Public Schools with the same level of dedication. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the League of Women Voters for organizing this forum, my fellow candidates here tonight, and all of you for being here. If you didn't know, I'm John Quinn, a proud King County resident of 14 years, husband to my wife, Shamika, and father of two daughters in the King County Public School System. Through my work with my nonprofit, the Bayside Warriors, I've acquired over a decade of experience as a family advocate, youth leader, and community organizer. I've worked endlessly to address critical issues like poverty, inclusion, and education. Currently, as a public behavior student advocate, I've implemented real solutions for students facing social economic challenges and mental health issues. My hands-on experience with youth is deep in my therapeutic understanding of their needs and the barriers they may face in life. I'm running for the Board of Education because our students and our families deserve strong, compassionate leadership. I'm ready to bring my proven track record to this role, and I believe these qualities uniquely qualify me to serve as a Board of Education member. And I ask you tonight for your support in making that vision a reality. Please enjoy tonight's forum, and I thank you for attending. Thank you, John. <coughs> Cheers. Good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you to my fellow co-candidates. My name is Pierce Harris Smith, and I'm asking for your vote for the Board of Education. I am a retired veteran and naturalized citizen. I am married to my high school sweetheart, Rebecca. We have two children, Arthur and Karen. I immigrated from England to the US in 75 and spent my childhood in Appalachia. I worked on a horse farm, studied meteorology and climatology before spending 23 years in the Air Force Medical Service. I deployed to Cuba, providing care to Cuban and Haitian immigrant and refugees, which inspired me to become a U.S. citizen as I saw people risk their lives for something that I took for granted. My last assignment was program manager of medical logistics, National Guard Bureau. I was responsible for ensuring units within the command were equipped to accomplish their mission and oversee 
exceeding the educational requirements of two career fields. The position involved analysis, deliberate planning, and the validation of requirements. I'm running for the Board of Education for several reasons. Kent County Public School, I believe, has suffered the progressive effects of administrations that have concentrated their efforts in growing a community of retirees and owners of second homes at the expense of young families and the infrastructure that would support them. I believe every child deserves an education that provides a level, level playing field for life. Education breaks the bonds of generational poverty and reflects the ideal that we are a nation of equal. Just as importantly, a representative democracy depends upon an educated constituency capable of critical thought. Also, local school boards have become the latest battleground in a bitter culture war. Kent County and our children deserve better. The only decisions should be based on objective analysis, deliberate planning, Thank and you. an impartial validation of requirements. Thank you. Francois. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you to everyone. I actually have saved all my thanks for the, the end of the evening, but I thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Francois Sullivan. I am currently serving the final year of my first term on the Kent County Public Schools Board of Education. I'm proud of the work that our board has been able to accomplish, but there's always more to do. I would like to have the opportunity to continue to work to move our schools forward and help our students succeed. As the youngest daughter of a career United States Marine Corps father, I have lived in various parts of our country, including North Carolina, California, Hawaii, Virginia, and Maryland. Between kindergarten and graduation from Crossland High School in Prince George's County, Maryland, I attended six different schools. I also spent a year studying elementary and special education at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Though teaching ultimately did not turn out to be my calling, I have enormous respect for those who dedicate their lives to our children. My husband, Mark, and I moved to Wharton from the Western Shore in 2003. We have two children who have attended Kent County Public Schools since first grade. When I'm not shuttling my kids around, I run a website design business. Uh, I work primarily with local nonprofits, artists, and small businesses. I'm proud to be a founding member of the school advocacy group supporter schools. I like to volunteer and be involved in our community and help, have helped organize the Just Your Tea Party Festival, the HP Festival, and I am on the marketing committee for the Garfield Center for the Arts. As I said, I hope to continue my work on Board of Education and to answer your questions to the best of my ability this evening. Thank you. The devastating impact of poverty is felt throughout King County. With King County Public Schools being number one on the Maryland Poverty Profile Report for the highest percentage of students living in poverty, it's time our public school systems started to address this problem by being proactive and not reactive. Poverty solutions require a holistic approach. There is no one size fits all. We must build a system that provides continuous support and respects the rights, dignity, and diversity of our students and their families. King County Public Schools needs to foster trust, accountability, and leadership development through community networks and mentorship. There is no quick journey out of poverty. Effective solutions must provide continuity of support over time. King County Public Schools must become consistent. As someone trained in economic mobility, I've personally helped King County families gain self-sufficiency through a coalition of addresses with that family, through a coalition that addresses family stability, financial management, education, and employment. I would recommend our staff and administration engage in economic mobility courses and workshops, such as sustainable communities and bridges out of poverty. These programs will help increase social capital and improve our strategic plan. The implement, implementation of these strategies will also build stronger organizational structure within King County Public Schools and ultimately benefit the students and the families of King County. I'm the only candidate on this panel tonight on the front line in the fight against poverty, providing solutions to families in need. With over 70% of our students in poverty, 
I believe the Kent County Public School System can become the leader in this fight against poverty. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, before we move on to the next candidate, um, candidates, just understand that I will repeat the question if you do request. Pierce. Good evening. The blueprint for Maryland identifies certain schools as community schools based upon the level of poverty of the students attending that school. So far, three of our five have been identified as community schools, and I suspect the other two will eventually. What the blueprint brings with it to community schools is increased access to educational service, tutoring, medical care, safe transport, and a host of other unique services that at-risk children need, whether they are children that suffer from uh, educational challenges or come from poverty. But poverty oftentimes is a mitigating, sorry, the poverty is oftentimes a condition that exacerbates already consist consisting conditions. I think that what we have here in Kent County is two parallel systems. We have a small number of very affluent residents and we have a large catchment of children who fall into the poverty definition. Many of those affluent parents are not going to send their children to public school. They never were. They, we have a thriving private school industry here in the area. The children that attend those schools, their parents know exactly what a good education is worth and they are willing to pay for it. Things will not change for the majority of our students that fall into the public school catchment until we as a community and commissioners that represent us understand that it takes investment to improve our schools. The state has stepped in and mandated improvements in our school system through the blueprint. I would suggest that we will see progress when we fall in line and follow those recommendations. We will do even better if we exceed the recommendations that the state has put in the blueprint. And I hope that we will see find ourselves there. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Okay. Uh, there are many barriers for children growing up in poverty. Language, hunger, transportation, homelessness. There are programs at the federal and state level that KCPS currently taps into to help overcome some of these barriers. As mentioned, all five of uh, KCPS schools, no, I'm sorry, you didn't mention that, the, we have three community schools. All five of KCPS schools are CEP eligible. CEP stands for Community Eligibility Provision and is a school meal funding option of the National School Lunch Act. CEP allows high poverty schools to offer free breakfast and lunch to all students, essentially becoming hunger-free schools. Schools and school districts with an identified student percentage of 40% or higher are eligible to elect CEP. Identified students are those students who are directly certified for free meals based on their participation in other programs, such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, and temp Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Four of our five KCPS schools, all three elementary schools and Kent County Middle School are Title I schools. Title I, schools, or Title I funds support social emotional learning, extra in instruction in reading and mathematics, additional teachers, materials of construction, as well as after school and summer programs to extend and reinforce the regular school curriculum. Three of our KCPS schools, Garnett, Rock Hall and Elementary School and Kent County Middle School are community schools. Community schools are public schools that provide services and support that fit each neighborhood's needs, created and run by the people who know our children best, all working together. Anyone with kids in Kent County knows how difficult it is to shop locally for their clothes and shoes. I would like to have the middle school consider a pilot for a uniform program with uniforms provided free of cost to all families. Uniforms help create a level playing field reduce the pressure on the students to wear trendy or expensive clothing, and can decrease feelings of inadequacy and promote a sense of equality among the students. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. Okay, 
We are here to move up. Oh, Sunday. Laura. Yeah. One characteristic of a successful school board, school board is to embrace and monitor data, even when the information is negative, and to use that data to drive continuous improvement. Maryland has been focused on closing the achievement gap for longer than I can remember, and poverty has been a seemingly insurmountable barrier. But Maryland has a new state superintendent, Dr. Carrie Wright, who served as the state superintendent in Mississippi from 2013 to 2022. Mississippi has the highest rate of poverty in the nation of any other state. On September 24th at the Maryland State Board of Education meeting, Dr. Wright gave an excellent presentation comparing Maryland and Mississippi's results of the National Assessment, as, yes, the National Assessment of Educational Progress also referred to as the nation's report card. It is the only assessment that is administered to every single state in the nation, and it is the only way we have to compare ourselves to other states. Her presentation showed that from 2013 to 2022, Maryland's proficiency rates declined, and Mississippi rates, proficiency rates improved. The data included students that received free or reduced lunch, African American and Hispanic students, and students with disabilities. It's important to understand that the decline in academic performance we've experienced is a statewide issue that's been occurring since 2013. Dr. Wright is working on a new literacy policy that aligns with the policy implemented in Mississippi so that Maryland students can achieve the same gains. Kent County has already taken the initiative to implement curriculum that is grounded in the science of reading, critical to the gains realized in Mississippi and I am committed to building on the work that's already being done to develop policies that address the, the needs of middle and high school readers, as well as the needs of younger readers as well. <laughs>
Students are encouraged to enroll in dual credit courses at Washington College and Chesapeake College, allowing them to earn both high school and college credits upon successful completion of the coursework. At the October 14th Board of Ed meeting, our Blueprint, Blueprint Coordinator, Tom Porter, shared the latest implementation update. Moving forward, we will be expanding our pre-K and three-year-old programs. Our first teacher cohort to complete their national board certification will be getting their results later this year, and we are on track for increasing the starting teacher salary. Over 50% of our students are enrolled in one of our 11 CTE programs, and 23% of our students are taking AP courses. Our CTE programs include Agricultural Science, Academy of Health Professions, Automotive Technician, Computer Science, Construction Trades, including Welding, FM Broadcasting, Culinary Arts, Project Lead the Way Pre-Engineering, Crime Rescue, Apprenticeship of Maryland Instruction and Work-Based work Learning, and the Teacher Academy. As mentioned in a previous question, three of our five schools are designated community schools with access to additional resources. The Lena Elementary School is most likely going to meet those requirements. Last year, we implemented a behavioral health screener and we'll be using that information to improve our students' supports. We will continue to work with the strategic facilitators offered at no cost to us to make sure we are allocating our budget and resources effectively and continue to make progress towards full implementation of the movement. Uh, I did canvassing in Rock Hall and Fairley over the last two weeks and the two biggest questions that I received were, how do I get students to come and work with me? And I explained to them, we are looking for businesses to set up for internships for our students. Thank you. Four. Conceptually, I support the pillars of the blueprint. And I know that a great deal of thought and collaboration went into their development. But I have some concerns. The state has a historical pattern of creating new boxes to fit everyone into which is the challenge of uniform standards. Whatever uniform standards were mandated for reading instruction prior to 2013 were clearly not effective and in fact quite detrimental. The blueprint is certainly a much bigger box. It has great ideas, so it appears like it has the, the potential to serve more students. Given the continual changes that administrative and educational staff makes in general, I think it's good for us to be mindful of the initiative fatigue or school reform or school reform fatigue. When schools are in a constant cycle of change, it can lead to teachers gradually withdrawing their emotional investment in new programs and resisting future implementation efforts. Leadership at every level has to stay aware of the human factor. Change, even good change, can be disorienting. There's often some measure of resistance or uncertainty that is triggered during adjustment periods. Communication remains key. While I support the pillars conceptually, I think it's unfortunate that the blueprint significantly restricts how funds are spent. Boards had a significant level of control, and the state took that flexibility and local control away when they enacted the blueprint. Boards now have a much lower amount of discretionary funds and are forced to make cuts, especially in areas like transportation, support staff, nurses, and instructional assistants. We don't have enough information to determine if the local, if the loss of local control is a fair trade for more money that the state controls from a distance. I suspect that the funding restrictions imposed by the blueprint were an unexpected consequence. John, may you repeat the question, please? Yes. The blueprint for Maryland's teacher is controversial because the state is imposing policies that were previously under local control. Do you support the Blueprint's goal of uniform standards to bring Maryland schools up to a competitive level of the best schools in the country? As a community leader, I support the intent of the Blueprint for Maryland's future and its potential to strengthen our public schools and communities. With over a decade of experience, <coughs> Excuse me. With over a decade of experience in working in public schools across Maryland, I've seen firsthand the advantages of the blueprint and what it has to offer. The blueprint unites communities by creating community schools which provide critical resources like housing support, food access, and after school learning programs which help students and families within that school district thrive. 
It promotes financial literacy programs, equipping students with skills in budgeting, investment, and debt management, which are essential to breaking the cycle of poverty in this community. The blueprint, it can also open doors to innovative agricultural programs, connecting local farmers right here in King County with students to create service learning opportunities, raise awareness about food systems and food insecurities, and promote career in agri per careers in agriculture. Also, through the college and career pathways, the blueprint can boost our local economy by increasing the earning potential of families from low and middle income backgrounds. As the King County captain and community partner for Strong Schools Maryland, I work with advocates across the state to ensure the blueprint is effectively implemented. Earlier this year, I voiced my support for the Blueprint in Annapolis at Blueprint, Blueprint for Merlin Day, and I've also written publicly in favor of the Blueprint with an article in Merlin Matters in June of 2023. The Blueprint for Merlin's future is an investment in our children, it is an investment in our schools, and it is an investment in our future of our county. Thank you. Um, I think, as I discussed before, uh, we've been doing universal pre-K for over 10 years, and I think that that has been a huge help for both our students and our families. So I would say that that is one, one thing that we're doing right. And I also have to say, for a small community with under 2,000 kids in our school, the fact that we have 11 CTE offerings at our high school, almost all of our CTE offerings are certificated, which means that when kids graduate, they graduate with a certificate prepared to go to a job. They graduate with enough credits to get into a college. So I think that those are two things that we're doing right. Um, two things that I think we need to work on. It, you know, I, I'm not a fan of standardized tests, and the, the standardized tests show us doing poorly in ELA and math and science, and we have been keeping an eye on this. It, they have changed the test three times since my kids have been in school, um, and they are actually working on yet another revision, so it is hard to follow that, but I, I you know, and, and do a comparison from year to year, but I think that we, we need to be aware of that, and we need to be aware that that is a touch point for many people when they look at what a good school looks like. Um, so I think that we need to work to improve those scores, and uh, I'm going to back piggyback on that as uh, we also need to really look at the disparity between our different student groups, between our African American students and our Hispanic students, or our English, English language learners, and try to improve their scores and try to improve the scores of them. Thank you, Francois. Laura? I agree with Francois, and, and with respect to our um, vocational program and the CTE, my, my own children have, have benefited greatly from those programs. Um, my son, Ethan, did um, the nursing program and was, had a lot of success with that. My younger son, Alistair, is now an electrician's apprentice, and so, um, you know, very much support elevating career readiness along with college readiness. And so I think you know, we're, we're ahead of things. You know, even though I do have some concerns about the blueprint, I believe that a strength of ours is the fact that we are ahead of many other counties in that way in terms of preparing, you know, regardless of the way things are now. We, we need to respond to what is expected now. And I believe our county is doing a great job um, in preparing for you know the mandates that are that are coming down, so I think we are ahead of things, and we are going to be ahead of those counties in terms of being prepared for that. Um, as far as needs, I really think we need to build relationships more with our community members. We need to be more welcoming. We need to be more inviting. There's a a, a, a wealth of um, well-educated retired professionals in our area that want to help our students, and, and we need to work with them and invite them in and um, benefit from their expertise and their heart to serve our students. You know, another need is I speak with staff and things like that, I think of in-house communication, I think needs to be improved. You know, everyone needs to be supported and 
while certainly good things are happening, I will say that you know not all staff do feel supported. And so how do we improve communication in-house so that you know kind of reduce the fear and then um, that that gives them the freedom to be more supportive to our students and to work more as a team and not work in silos. You know, there needs to be more in-house collaboration. And that's what you know just boosts morale overall. And so I think that is an area we need to improve. Thank you, Laura. John. Ideally, you would want our school systems to do 100% of everything correctly. I think this question is perception and experience. You can talk to different people in the community and get different outlooks and different answers on what's right and wrong about the community. What's right, I do believe that the CTE program is in the right direction. I think it can be improved with the builders of the blueprint and the funding specifically for CTE programming to start making things more practical and hands-on, where it's not so much onus on standardized testing. So I do think CTE is in the right direction. I also agree that pre-K uh, is in the right direction. Also, another good thing our school system, school system is doing very well is we're still trying to educate our students with limited resources. A lot of the issues we have is from lack of funding. We're still maintaining our schools. No school hasn't closed recently due to the lack of funding, and we're still fighting to educate our community. Some of the things that I think we can do better or we're not as effective, the first one I would say is using those resources in our community to help our shortcomings. A lot of times we complain about the retirement community, but I think that is a place that's untapped and they have information, knowledge, and resources that we can use. King County has the most nonprofits per capita in the state of Maryland based on population. We have a lot of resources nonprofit-wise that will step up to the plate and help our school system when we fall short. Uh, a lot of opportunities are for funding and grants and things of that nature in our community, and I think we can be more proactive with partnering with the community and its leadership as far as the resources is, is our concern. Another issue that I've come to find out in our community is the transparency with communication Thank of you. policies. Here's. <clears throat> I think we could probably do a better job with community communication. I've had people in the community come to me and tell me things about our schools which they believe, and they're just not true. And I don't believe that those people were motivated by balance whatsoever. I think there's a lot of information out there, but it's not always easily digestible. On the same note, but somewhat different, I would say fiscal transparency. And you'll probably think I'm going to talk about the commissions only a little bit. I think that it's fair that the people in the county know what it is that we take to the commissioners with a budget and say, look, this is the legal minimum that we've got to meet. This is how much it's going to be to cost. That's our advisory role. This is what we want to do above the legal minimum. This is why we think it's important. And if it's not going to be funded, you will deserve to know why. But I think you also deserve fiscal transparency within the school system itself. Each budget is an appropriated money given to the school to achieve certain goals. Those programs within the schools that have had money assigned to them through appropriation should have easy access to it. You should not have teachers who have got broken equipment or a lack of access to material because it has been too difficult for them to access the money appropriated for their programs. I have also been told that that happens. That's shooting ourselves in the foot. On the bright side, very simply, I think the two best things that we have going for us are people and programs. One of my sons, a 16 year old, is well established on the autism spectrum and he's struggling in his adolescence. He is part of the Kent Alternative Program and I cannot say enough good about what the people in the high school are doing for him in that program. He is in a precarious time in his life. He is difficult for me to understand. There are teachers in his school that care for him absolutely and go out of their way to ensure that he has a meaningful learning experience when he goes to school. Thank you, Chris.
this a lot. You know, I work for uh, a nonprofit called Benedictine. It's a school in uh, Caroline County. We serve children and students and adults with developmental disabilities. And so, you know, there is never, for any agency that's relying on state funds, and, and Benedictine relies primarily on DEA funds, state and federal funds are, are never sufficient. They just aren't. And so it requires a lot of fundraising. Um, and, and, and Benedictine happens to be excellent at fundraising. Now, I I am not an expert at fundraising, but I have, you know, but working at that organization, my, my thought coming into this, I thought, as a board member, you know, how do I start to learn from people that are good at raising money? So my, you know, when I think, I don't necessarily, my thought is to think about raising taxes as much as being more successful at how do we more successfully fundraise? Because I work for an organization that does that really well, so how do I learn from the best so that I can duplicate those efforts and bring that here? There are people in this county that raise money for all kinds of different projects all the time and raise money around the states. And so how do we become better at that? How do we think more like a business? How do we think more competitively? And how do we become a better product so that people want to support it? And so that's that's where my mind goes. How do we improve? And, and be mindful of the other school options that parents do have available to them, and then get more buy-in so that we can naturally get more supports that way. But I do think we need to really think, be thinking more like nonprofits and fundraising. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> John, even though I do agree with the intent of the blueprint, I think my goals is absolutely correct on the math uh, part of it. It's, it's very difficult with the proposed plan to move forward and address things through funding or monetary uh, specifics within our school district. One of the thoughts, because this is one of these questions that might not go away for the next 10 years, so one of my thoughts is how do we combine and consolidate things? One of my ideas, now this is an idea, is go to a campus style layout out in Warren, where we already have got the nine in the new middle school, so we might go to the county commissioners and see what funding they do have to give that's ready right now and think about adding additions to the high school area to make that sort of a campus. Uh, one of my pitches would be turn the high school into something maybe for 6th through ninth grade and the new building be for 10th through 12th with the AP and honor students there. In that campus setting, what it do is consolidate resources from around the county and make everything in a central location so we're not stretching our dollar too thin. Also, study from a university-style campus. Not only is the student enrichment that goes on, but the savings and money per year in the physical budget starts to decrease and we start to have money to put aside in the emergency fund or the county commissioners can help supplement with the, mem the MOE. Also, with, with this, I don't know if... Um, Fundraising is the answer. I think that's hard, but I do think we can go for federal grants, like the SRS grant, if I'm not mistaken, where there's no strings attached, where they can be used for additional resources, maybe teacher pay and things of that nature. So we gotta look at more federal grants, maybe hiring uh, three or four full-time people to just go for federal grants, but also look for state funding and build a better relationship with our state representation in Annapolis. A lot of the funding and shortcomings that we have is due to the lack of relationship that we have in Annapolis. I think we should work with our state delegation and our district leaders better to start to find funding that relates to a rural area. Pierce. First of all, the blueprint is law, so that's something that we ought to recognize. The state implemented the blueprint because we had neglected to meet responsibilities that the blueprint addresses. If we had neglected those responsibilities, that bill would be neither so high nor so steep. Making up for a deficit is always more onerous than meeting it for the first time. Additionally, the school board does not raise revenue. We advise the commissioners of the cost of operating the school. Asking the school board to solve a revenue problem which is not the area of their responsibility it is a little bit of an odd question, but I understand why it's raised by the community. Something that I would bring up is a letter writing, advocacy, and testimony program started 
some years ago by a local grassroots organization, petitioned Annapolis to help Kent County Public Schools with their financial deficit. That program was so effective that Annapolis said they would need any monies that Kent County put on the table for Kent County Public Schools over minimum of effort. The county declined that offer. Now, I don't believe we're going to solve our financial problems if we have commissioners who look at free money from the state and decide that it's not worth taking. I cannot explain that decision. And when I talk about us as a community having to change the way we view our schools, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Pierce. Francois. Um, unfortunately, fundraising is not a viable option for us to balance our budget. Um, we are not allowed to fundraise to balance the budget for, for our recurring expenses. And I, I'm 80 to 90 percent of our budget is salary, and so we can't unfortunately fundraise to do that. Um, I, I would plan to see that if other people are willing to consider a donation, why not be willing to consider a raise in taxes? This is not the only way that we can raise revenue. It is not on the board to be able to make that decision to raise revenue, but if the, the, the body is willing, then let's find a way for you to help support our schools. Um, being a small, high-poverty school district is a challenge because Kent County is considered wealthy by the calculator used to determine school funding. This is something that I bring up every time I go to Annapolis. I bring it up every time I speak to our delegates. We just had the main conference a few weeks ago, um, which is the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. I brought it up there. I just, I'm on the legislative committee, and I brought it up yesterday at the legislative committee meeting about what our priorities need to be. That, that wealth calculator needs to be reviewed. Um, prior to the announcement of the blueprint, yes, we did have more say in how funding was allocated, but we had such a tight shoestring budget anyway that it wasn't. Everything is going to salary. We're still, most of our resources go towards salary because that is the amount of funding that we get. Um, we're going to need to make some tough decisions about reallocating resources and possibly redistricting to better serve our students. Um, every year, balancing the budget is a struggle. We have are, are fortunate that in the last 10 years, we have been able to, to save some money in our fund balance because we've had to balance our budget every year, pulling funds from our fund balance. Uh, as, you know, Thank you, to, to almost the amount of $2 million each year just to cover our budget. So thank you. I think the Maryland State Board of Education should ultimately decide, but as a Board of Ed member, we should also govern the policies here in our county. And in order to do that, I think sometimes we have to start leaning on our community more for their perspective. A lot of times we sit up here and we make decisions for the masses without speaking to the masses. Um, anything that improves reading and writing should be taught in our classrooms. I think where the arguments or the lack of communication comes is when political point of views come in. Whether right or wrong, we need to keep that out of the classroom. What goes on in your personal household is your personal business. What goes on in our classroom should be able to make well-rounded students that can produce in society. And we have to teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic. Foremost. After that, civic responsibility, and then be a secondary component to the household and the parents and the people that are caregivers to these students. So curriculum-wise, uh, the state mandates that by law, and we are to oversee those policies. But with those policies, we do have uh, a choice to decide what can be in our school and what cannot. And I think that's a bigger decision to just one individual board member. I think we go community first, and then we go to the experts as far as staff, maybe school boards after that, and let them decide ultimately what curriculum makes them comfortable. Because a lot of times we need to figure
get that part off first. If teachers are comfortable with teaching a certain curriculum, then we improve that curriculum. If teachers are not, then we need to discuss about ways to make our teachers comfortable because they're also on the front line as well. So that would be my stance. Thank you, John. Pierce. So as I mentioned in my introduction, I am an immigrant and a naturalized citizen. And my motivation for becoming a citizen was providing care on a humanitarian mission to Cuban and Haitian refugees and migrants. And that was a formative experience for me, and I internalized what America meant for me during that experience. And I believe if I can address what I think is the root of your question, which is what do we teach and why? I think that there are three moral pillars that support our society, and that's the idea of liberty, equality, and justice. And what that means for me, liberty-wise, is that I either have to like or approve of what my neighbor does, so long as it does not make contact with my rights, and even when it does make contact with my rights, then justice uh, traits, which is more important, the right, the, the freedom, or the, or the, the right that's been contacted. There's also an idea that's tossed about lately that somehow the educational process should not make people feel uncomfortable. I could not disagree more. If education does not make you feel uncomfortable, you're not being educated. The very process of education is identifying which beliefs and ideas you have don't withstand the scrutiny of logic and reason and abandoning them. That's, that's education. You might not like it, but that's the way it works. Uh, as as far as who gets to make that decision, I would also say that that happens at the state level. Uh, I, I do not understand the idea that we believe in equality and yet we're not giving our children an equal chance, an equal, an equal stir. That is what education is. It's not just an equal stir on the playing field of life, though it is also necessary for the well-being of our representative democracy. We need a classical education that equips children to be critical thinkers and to be able to understand whether or not the line of logic withstands, runs unbroken through an Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Francois. Um, so MSCD sets up the core standards, and the, each school district determines what curriculum meets those core standards. In many cases, there's only a single or a couple different types of curriculum that will meet those standards, and so many of the school districts in Maryland will use the same sort of curriculum. Um, our education specialists and teachers discuss and research what will be the best curriculum for our students, and I think we need to be careful about when we talk about limiting content, because what we're really saying is we're limiting knowledge. And our students are going to be global citizens, and they need to be able to compete with other global citizens outside of our district, outside of the state of Maryland, outside of our country, eventually. So we need to make sure that they have all of the tools necessary to be the best citizens they can be. Um, the job of the board in curriculum is to approve when curriculum comes before us, ask questions, find out why the curriculum was chosen, find out what core standards it needs, find out if it's age appropriate and how it will be utilized in the classroom. Um, Kent County High School, actually, within the last two years, we added two uh, subjects to the curriculum. We added the African American history as a curriculum item and um, American Sign Language. So while we, as a board, vote on the curriculum that is presented to us, it is up to the educators to select the curriculum that best meets the core standards passed down by MSD. Thank you, Francois. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. I think what I hear you when you're in is, is there's a lot of fear in, in the nation and in the state about what's happening inside the classroom. And so, the technicalities, right, as Francois spoke of, of, of how things get determined, boards make those decisions, and, and they, there's a thoughtful process behind that. But it really comes down to, do parents trust what's happening in the classroom? And so, because there's what's approved in terms of the curriculum, and then there's what's taught. And I think if we can invite 
give more opportunities for parents to see what's happening in our classroom, I think it will put a lot of minds at ease. Because um, my own experiences, like I said, 18 years with Ken County Public Schools, my own experiences have been when I have personally reached out to a teacher or an administrator, um, I've gotten a good response from that. I remember when um, the health education curriculum came up last year, my daughter was in eighth grade. I reached out to the um, teacher and said, hey, can you send me that information? I would just like to take a look at it. You know, I took a couple emails to get it, but, but I did receive that information and I was satisfied with the content that I saw. And so I will say that process needs to be more accessible to most parents. I think that's where there's some barriers where like I know how to you know, send those friendly reminders, hey, I didn't get that information yet, but, but a lot of parents don't have time for that. You know, so how do we make what's happening in the classroom more accessible so that we can build trust? Because parents just want to know, can I trust that um, it's not, because it's not about the curriculum, it's about any specific teacher bringing their own personal agenda and adding to what has been approved, right? That That's where the issue is, the trust, is can I trust that the teacher will respect what's been approved and stick to just that and not add to it. And so I think the more we can bring parents in the classroom and other family members, then, then we can build that trust that no, we're just here to teach, we're here to prepare your children for the future, we're here to prepare that we're, we're not adding to what's been approved. And we're not trying to coerce or convince, we're just here to teach. And, and, and when there's more transparency, that's when there's more trust. Thank you for the surprise me. I didn't realize I was up first. I was starting to ruminate about what I was going to say. Here I am saying um, One, I would like to put confidence and faith in the blueprint. I think the blueprint has a lot of mechanisms in it to address the disparities that you are concerned with, that we should all be concerned with. I think that this also goes back to the earlier question, there's some overlap. I think in education there's an awful lot of overlap, but we, two years ago when we went through this process, we had the question of whether, what we thought about critical race theory in the schools, and whether or not how we were going to teach America's history of race was something that we were comfortable with as a people. I don't think you can address disparity without discussing the courses and the history of disparity. So there's some overlap. Uh, primarily, I would say that we have to recognize also that what I spoke of before exists, that we are a county with a large poor population. We're perceived as rich by the state, and we have a flourishing private school industry. Unless we decide that we are going to make our public schools as good and as providing as fine an edu education as any educational organization can provide, we're going to have disparity. It, it requires resources. You cannot criticize an organization for failing to meet its mission if it is not resourced properly. I think that what the blueprint recognizes is that a lot of children that come from poverty or other backgrounds that might have complications is that they are more resource heavy to educate. That is why they give us more money for schools that have more children from a background of poverty. It's resources. Thank you, Pierce. Francois. Um, so, some ways to help us improve that disparity are by um, making sure that we're prov providing training for our teachers. At the February 12th Board of Education meeting, our Blueprint Coordinator and CT Director Tom Porter gave a presentation on the KCPS education equity policy and discussed equity driven training that staff have attended. This training includes REI training, which is racial, the Racial Equity Institute training, culturally responsive teaching training, and restorative practices training. Not all KCPS staff have been able to attend trainings, and I would like to see us have all staff attend these trainings. Um, we need to be providing inclusive courses and materials. Another way to improve outcomes is to ensure that the curriculum is culturally responsive and meets the needs of our students. Uh, new courses 
but as I mentioned, we're introduced at the high school. I'd like to have our schools continue to tap into our rich, diverse Kent County history and expand partnerships with organizations that can provide hands-on materials and resources for students and teachers, um, including Summer Hall, Washington College, and Chesapeake Department. Um, students should learn about the people who should, students should learn about the people who share their backgrounds and interests who were pioneers of change here in Kent County. And by tracking data, we should continue to use data to identify students who may be at risk of falling behind academically early on and provide targeted interventions and support services to address their specific needs. That means not waiting for the MCAT scores when they come out once a year in September. That means making use of our math data that our teachers are tracking every year or every, every day. Um, KCPS has provided tutoring, academic enrichment programs, and social emotional support to help students overcome barriers to learning. We need more tutors and volunteers in our schools to help with these needs. So, thank you. Thank you, Francois and Laura. Thank you for your question. Um, a few thoughts that I have. Some of it goes back to um, the initiative that Dr. Wright is doing at the state level uh, with respect to trying to implement strategies that were in Mississippi here in Maryland. Again, keeping in mind that Mississippi being the, the poorest state in the nation. And so there's things that can happen on a policy level that can help improve student progress. And, and, and those are changes that we can make in-house. But when I think about, again, building relationships, connecting with students, doing things that are meaningful to them, and, and, and following their lead, how often are we really asking students what we want and then responding to that? You know, students, especially someone your age, right, is well able to say, hey, this is what matters to me, and this is what's meaningful to me, and this is how you connect with me. And so are, are, we, are we effectively communicating with our students and then getting that data and then being responsive to that? And Because it, it really comes down to when someone has the heart to connect with a student, they go out of their way to do it. And, and you, I'm sure, I've no doubt you have teachers that you connect well with and some that, for whatever reason, that teacher may just need some more support to learn how to connect with students. And when that happens, people become more responsive. When families are important, how do we, you know, we're already doing a lot of work in engaging families, how do we meet people where they are? Because I sure enough see a lot of families at sports events. Are we, take, are we capitalizing on those moments to connect with families on things that are important to them and say, hey, by the way, did you know about this? Did you know about that? And so how do we get out more where people are and get buy-in and say, you know what, this is a team here. What's important to you is important to me, and I want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that. And so I think that's where we need to do a better job at, at, at connecting to what matters most to our students. Thank you, Laura. John. The disparity gap in King County Public Schools with African American students has widened over the last 16 years. African American students are learning three times slower than non English speaking students. They're learning three times slower than students with 504s and IEPs. They sit in the same classroom with their white counterpart, Spanish counterpart, and other learning the same curriculum. Why aren't they getting this? Why aren't they understanding? And why are they falling behind? It's a layered question. The first thing I would say is the environment they live in. Most of the African American students in, in King County Public Schools live in high poverty and high poverty areas. When they go home, they're worried about survival. When they come to school, they're worried about survival. They're not worried about curriculum and passing a standardized test. They're worried about, is their mother coming home on drugs tonight? They're worried about, is their grandmother going to be able to provide a meal? These type of things cause trauma in all students, not just black students, because a lot of students are behind. The gap is just a little wider due to numbers with black students. Teaching critical race theory is not going to teach my daughter how to become a lawyer. It's not. It's not going to teach my daughter how to read and how to write. We need curriculum to start teaching these young ladies, young men of all colors, how to produce in the world. I'm African American and I'm the only black candidate up here. I can throw the race card around all night. It gets us nowhere. We're gonna come here next year, we're gonna talk about the next demographic, or the next demographic. Let's take away some of the labels 
and just get back to what really matters, educating students and making our school system better.
So I just want to highlight some of my work experience and share a few thoughts to give you a better understanding of how I intend to be a meaningful contributor, contributor as a board member. I have almost 11 years of experience collaborating effectively with a diverse set of professionals, both within the school and statewide. Effective collaboration and advocacy is not without its moments of conflict or tension. I have years of experience learning how to lean into that conflict and tension and stay mindful of the fact that we all have the same motivation to see our students and families succeed. We're just trying to figure out how to get there. Honest communication that occurs in an environment where everyone's voice is given space allows for creativity to come forth and that's how great ideas happen. Because it's not about one person getting the glory, everyone needs to have buy-in, students, families, staff, and the community. I really appreciate Dr. McComas's concerted efforts in trying to rebuild some bridges that had seemingly washed away. She needs team members who are equally as committed to accessibility and responsiveness. Throughout this campaign, I've done my best to put myself out there and meet as many people as possible because there is no replacement for face-to-face -face contact. Most recently, I was the only candidate to attend the first community conversation event that happened last week at Kalina Elementary. It was an engaging and informative experience. I encourage as many people as possible to attend future community conversation events. As a board member, I would take personal responsibility in doing my best to promote enrollment and academic progress. King County Public Schools are worth fighting for. I am a fighter, and I thank you for your vote.